My name is Sanjay Gupta, I'm a consultant cardiologist and today I wanted to do a video on the long QT syndrome which a lot of people have written to me about and asked me um, it's not uncommon for a patient to have an ECG and then they read the interpretation on the ECG or the GP reads it and says oh you've got a long QT and this causes a great deal of anxiety so I'm really fortunate today to ask one of my colleagues who's an electrophysiologist Dr Hayes uh, to um, tell us a little bit about the long QT syndrome and in particular could you tell us what the long QT um, uh, syndrome is? Uh, yes, so the long QT syndrome is a genetic syndrome which is related to the difficulty of repolarization or delay in repolarization on your on the ECG and can be dangerous in certain people. And we get a lot of referrals for this, not all of which are significant. So is it always a genetic thing or can you acquire it? So no, it can be either and it can be caused by, uh, there's a lot of drugs that could cause it. So you can have a completely normal heart but you can go on a drug and that could cause you to have a long QT? Yes. Okay. So. Uh, in your practice, how often do you get referred patients uh, with the long Q where the GP has found the QT to be prolonged? I think it's it's relatively common for an ECG to show long QT syndrome or to suggest long QT syndrome, but those ECGs need to be looked at by an expert to see if they are truly showing a prolonged QT or if there is an abnormality of the assessment by the computerized assessment. Do you find that the compute, the algorithm on the ECG, do you find that that is um, accurate or, uh, or uh, can it get it wrong? I think it, you would say that in most cases the, there is an accurate result mm -hmm. but quite often when it is the machine has suggested that the QT is long, it can it can be wrong about that. Okay, because uh, presumably the QT has to be corrected to the heart rate. The it does and there are some it, there are some issues with the formula for that, but the machine itself does correct it. The usual reason why the machine might misread it is actually picking out where the Q is and where the end of the oh, T is, right, okay. which particularly there's a bit of wobble on the ECG or s something, some movement, mm -hmm. it, it can make a mistake as to where these parts of the complexes are. Can you tell me what the normal ranges are for uh, QTC and when do you get worried about the QTC? So the, the QTC, which is the corrected QT interval, corrected to a heart mm -hmm. rate of 60, is normally should be less than 440 in a man or 460 in a woman okay and off little rises above that are not too concerning but we would certainly worry if we saw one over 500 okay so that's when you would start worrying I think if, that's some, the, if someone came in uh, and the GP referred and said oh the QTC is 470 um, what would you do I think anything that is prolonged and you would take seriously and you would look into looking for is it truly prolonged, is there okay. a cause, but over 500 is when you'd be much more concerned. Because over 500 you think that there is truly a likelihood that there is prolonged QT here and it's unlikely that it's just the machine finding it difficult to detect the end of the T wave. Yes, to, to a large extent and there's a, there's, well the machine can make it, can get, can get it wildly wrong so okay. that's not always the case. But certainly in assessing whether somebody truly has long QT syndrome, mm -hmm. even if a QT is prolonged, the more prolonged it is, the more likely they are that they actually truly do have QT syndrome. Okay. What is your main concern with the QT syndrome as a doctor? The, the main concern is of ventricular arrhythmias, which can, can be dangerous. And can present and as blackouts present, yes. or even cardiac Black. arrest? Blackouts, cardiac arrest, perhaps occasionally palpitations, but usually blackouts, cardiac arrest. Okay. 
So if so, are there any red flag signs that you look for when you have um, when you have um, you know a patient is referred to you? They say, oh, the QT is prolonged. You look and you say, yeah, maybe the QT is prolonged. Are there any red flag signs you look for? So the the things that you would look for that would worry you would be the length of the QT interval on the ECG, mm-hmm. any history of blackouts in the person presenting, okay. and any history of young sudden cardiac death in the family. Young being? Young being usually defined as less than 35, but we take seriously anything up to around 50. Okay. Uh, what about, there was some where I read that even, you know, a family or a, a past history of epileptic fits. Uh, could yes, they epileptic fits as well. Um, because they could be blackouts. They're a presentation of them blackout where someone has mistaken them yeah. to be epilepsy yeah. so if someone has been a history of fits in the past and a particularly prolonged QT would make you a little bit more worried certainly yes if you have a ventricular arrhythmia and you cut off the blood supply to your brain which is what happens that can result simply in a blackout but it can also result in a seizure the brain reacting right. to the poor blood supply okay uh, let's say a person comes in and the, they don't have any of those things. They don't have any of those red flag signs. What would you do in your practice? You would look at well, look at the look at the ECG itself. Look at how long it is. You would look for any causes in the medication they were taking. Anything that could prolong this or prolong the QT and also um, and their electrolytes and make an assessment as to whether you thought this was likely to reflect a prolonged QT or whether it was a spurious result okay. and you'd probably look at the ECG again if you were unsure about the level you might end up assessing the QT interval both on a running test to see that it's shortened appropriately okay and possibly on a 24-hour ECG ECG. monitor to look at how the QT interval changed over time okay so what you're saying is that if you had a abnormal QT it was less likely to shorten with exercise yes Okay, that's really it's interesting. Pathological abnormal. Yes. Okay, that's interesting. So that would form part of the diagnostic workup. Is there um, any particular medication that you come across uh, more often than others, which makes you think? You know, when is there one particular thing that you've come across in your practice uh, uh, that pushes people's QTs up? Yeah. Out? So I guess chronically chronic medication that does it most commonly are some of the. Um, we call them antidepressants and antipsychotic medications okay um, and uh, acutely some antibiotics will do it so they're okay. probably the commonest thing so if someone has is taking an antidepressant are they the tricyclic antidepressants or, or is it um yes the tri- to, to some extent they all can do it they can all no, do it. there's okay. no one that you would say doesn't at all but, but if uh, someone is on antidepressants and they're going to be on antibiotics then it may be something just to be wary of there's, certainly be wary of it for particular antibiotics that can do it, yes. Like and erythromycin. Erythromycin and erythromycin. Okay. One of the important things if somebody is felt to have long QT syndrome mm-hmm. is that we always give them information. There is a website which gives details of all the drugs that can prolong the QT interval. Okay. And to be aware of that and make sure they don't end up taking those. Which website is that? Website we tend to use one called qtdrugs.org. Okay, great. Because there are a bunch of drugs on there that can do it. Okay. There's too many to go in just on on. Perfect. Um, So in okay, so that's really helpful. In terms of the number of patients that are referred to you with query long QT, how many do you think in a percentage do you really find that there is a problem and how many do you end up just reassuring and letting go home? In your practice? I think there are, from the referrals we get um, as a non tertiary referral centre, so most referrals from GPs, 
probably about three quarters of them are not likely to be a, a long QT syndrome or maybe more. Okay. There are some which are borderline and we end up saying, well, perhaps we should avoid certain medications. Okay. Even of the ones which are felt to be significant, most of those patients go on to a beta blocker and it's un unusual for, but not unheard mm -hmm. of, and certainly some people do, to end up with a defibrillator device for okay. protection. But out of a hundred patients, for example, you would say what, one or two? One or two would end up with that. Gosh, patients. right, so, so the majority of uh, can just, you know, a cardiologist can reassure almost 75% of patients that come to them. them refer, yes, oh, that wow, is. that's really good. So great. Um, so Chris, um, it's uh, thank you so much for talking to me. Um, if anyone wants to consult you because of your EP uh, expertise, how do they do that? Um, well, I'm based in York, so I practice in yeah. We're colleagues, yeah, of course. York, York Hospital, York Nuffield Hospital, and also in Harrogate. Okay, so people can come and see you privately at the Nuffield and Harrogate, and they can yeah. see you on the NHS in York. In York. Great. Okay, lovely. Thank All you right. so much. No Thank you. Bye. Thank you.